This is the Game Design Live Chat. Um, I'm Carla Kopp. I'm a designer, developer, publisher with Weird Giraffe Games and Galactic Raptor Games. And we have the amazing, amazing Helena Capel here. Uh, she also runs two different um, board game companies, Kids Table and Burnt Island. Um, and she can tell you more about how she's like so perfect and Canadian if she wants. <laughs> oh my God. That was the nicest introduction I've ever gotten. Like even nicer than at my wedding for my wedding speech. <laughs> uh, okay, so I am Helena Capel. Um, I spent 18 years as a teacher. Uh, in that time, I started a family and uh, became a gamer. Basically, when my before my kids were born, um, and after my kids got old enough to start playing games, I started realizing that uh, the games that we had for them were really terrible. Not necessarily terrible for them, but terrible for me. And uh, I want to enjoy myself when I spend hours upon hours playing a game with my kids. And uh, so I did some research and there were some interesting things out there, but at that point there really wasn't a lot that was going to be engaging for me and engaging for, for my children. And so um, at that time, uh, my husband and I were designing a game together. It's not Food Fighters yet. It actually was called Shoe Tree. Um, it didn't have a theme. Uh, and in fact, it, we wanted it to be a little bit more like um, abstract and didn't have kids or families in mind when when we started designing it and uh you know we started discussing who we could show the game to and you know as companies came up the idea of not having a theme on this game which was awesome um and that everyone who played it loved it but not having a theme on it felt weird to me um so we started playing with what kind of themes would work uh, and then we got into um, a food fight. Uh, we published that game together, decided because it felt like family that we needed to do it ourselves. Um, I started a company, Josh did the art, and basically all of the creative stuff for the game. Uh, Josh is my husband and my partner. Um, and then we just decided, I guess we have a, a publishing company, so let's continue doing this and designing games. And uh, we published a second game called Problem Picnic. It's a Scott Alms game. Um, that went just as well as the first one, or even a little bit better for us. And uh, at that time, a previous game that Josh had worked on called Endeavor, um, stopped being published by Z-Man Games. And uh, I, it was my favorite game at the time. And I thought, you know, we've got this publishing company. I think maybe I can do something with this game that's my favorite game. And this would be the best thing that could ever happen to me in my life. Um, and so we approached the designers and it took about a year to convince them that we were the right way to go. And I couldn't publish, um, a midweight Euro game under the uh, kids table umbrella. So I decided that I was going to start a second brand, just like you did, uh, Carla. Um, and so that's Burnt Island Games. And uh, Carla and I were just talking a couple of minutes ago about the fact that um, I'm going back to the classroom next year. So for the last two years, I've been doing this uh, designing and publishing games full time. Uh, and before that, I was doing it while I was teaching full time. And it just it got a little bit too much for me. Um, but, you know, during the recent experiences we're all having, retail sales have gone down quite a bit. And so far, we're okay. Um, but I am not sure what next year is going to bring. And so just to be safe, I'm going back to teaching next year. So um, I am hesitant and also excited about it because I am a teacher at heart, even though this is, I'm living my dream right now by, by doing publishing. 
So that is a long story of who I am. But it's <laughs> such an interesting one. Um, and Helena has also worked with uh, the game's recreators, um, Haunt the House, Bugs on Rugs, like so many uh, fantastic games uh, that Thanks. have been out there. Oh, yeah. uh, what was the, the one with Burr Island? Um, I played it recently. It was um, In the, the one with the, the triangle. Thing? Yeah, yeah, that one is definitely super cool. Um, if you haven't heard of In the Hall of the Mountain King, um, it's by it's based on that song where like it keeps on building and building, and it really it has that feeling to it. It's super cool. Um, Good research, Carla. <laughs> oh, well, I played it. Um, yes. It must have been like... Four, five. It was like before, um, right when the Kickstarter backers were getting the games, because uh, Jeremy was super excited. Yeah, it's yeah. it's so good. I uh, the first time I played that game, it was different. Um, everybody had their own player boards, and and you weren't competing as much. It, it seemed like a solo game that we were all playing next to each other. There's no competition, uh, other than hiring trolls, um, but. The first time I played it, I was like, this game is special and I have to do something with it. Like this has to be, this has to be my game. So I, I basically, I basically signed it on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yes, why I was super interested in it. Well, what, uh, the uh, whole like building on each other, but also polyaminos. Like mm -hmm. I, polyaminos are just like, I love them. Like so many people love them. There's so many yeah. new games with polyaminos. Yeah. Like, yeah, I love those games too. Um, oh, and here is Connor. Sorry. Um, so uh, let's get into it because we got like so many questions from the audience already. Um, cool. So um, are there any mechanisms um, that you'd rather not use when appealing to both kids and adults? And a uh, follow-up would be um, any mechanisms that work particularly well. Um, I'm not sure that there are no mechanisms that I wouldn't use. I think the idea would be to try to make mechanisms uh, child-friendly or family-friendly. Most of our games are eight plus, um, and typically that really means that a six-year-old can play it. So if I can find a mechanism that can be explained and experienced easy enough for a six-year-old, then I would use it. And I haven't really come across many mechanisms, like standard mechanisms like card drafting or worker placement or whatever, um, that can't be properly explained to a kid and you know yeah I, th I think that there isn't anything that you can't put in the proper place um for kids yeah okay um that's interesting because somebody um specifically asked about um dexterity and bluffing so uh, that's interesting because we have dexterity in one of our games and bluffing in another game. Um, one of the things, especially as a teacher and a parent, that I think is really important is to be able to teach children how to lose um, and how not to be successful graciously. And by graciously, I mean not cry after they didn't get what they wanted or they didn't win. Um, Dexterity games are difficult with younger kids. That's not to say that they can't play dexterity games. And I'll give you an example of, of <laughs> how sometimes they can be better than adults. Um, our game Problem Picnic is a dice chucking dexterity game. And essentially what you're trying to do is you've got um, a set of dice and you're trying to take those dice and roll them onto cards so that you can collect the cards. I am so bad at this game. It's like, I love the game, it's a lot of fun. I actually play it with my friends sometimes, but it's, I'm so bad at it. And my kids are amazing. Um, and so I think because they have smaller hands and, and you know, just their whole experience in front of the table is a little bit uh, not as imposing as mine is, it makes them more successful. Now, not all dexterity games are gonna be good for little kids. Um, 
especially little, little kids. Like I wouldn't put a three-year-old in front of uh, something that's very delicate. Um, we played junk art with my kids when my youngest was about four. And after one round, he was like in tears and it was a disaster. I would never play that game again with a young child. So there are games that you can, uh, that you can use. What was the other example? Uh, bluffing. Bluffing. So um, in Haunt the House, there is an element of bluffing. And I think it takes younger kids a while to understand how that works. Um, but all of our games have this, uh, what we call emergent strategy, where um, you can start playing it and you don't you maybe don't have an idea of why you're doing the thing that you're doing, you're just doing it. But as the game unfolds and as you play multiple times, that strategy becomes apparent to kids. And one of those things is bluffing. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Hot the House, you are bluffing from time to time. And from what I've seen of kids playing this game, they start getting it after a little while. Yeah. Do kids ever have like a problem with bluffing, like knowing the difference between bluffing and like lying? Lying? Uh, yeah, I think when it's in a game, it makes that that piece of it a little bit lighter because nobody's ever really taking anything very seriously. Um, and that's a a great teachable moment too. You know, uh, if a if a kid said to me that they felt bad doing that and and telling somebody it was something and it was something else. Um, you know, you, you can have a discussion with a kid about when it's right to do something like that when you're playing a game or when it's wrong to do something like that in real life to your parents. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point about it being like a, a topic you can then talk about because like, um, they're going to like realize that eventually, but realizing it in like a friendly, like environment. It's so safe. It's so safe for them. And uh, with, especially when I worked with really young children, I would always suggest to parents that they bring games into their home so that they understand that it's okay that they don't get their turn immediately when they want it, or um, they have an easier time understanding that someone else is going to benefit from the thing that they did, not just them. So. Mm -hmm. So um, our next question is, do you, or, um, are there some things that designers might not know would be bad for kids um, that are actually pretty bad, like um, things you shouldn't do? That is usually where theme comes in. Um, we do a lot of designing games for adults so, and so that kids can play. And so we have to be very careful about the themes that we choose um, because they have to be approachable for children and at the same time engage adults as well. Um, I also think that the take that mechanism um, that exists in some games is a difficult thing for some children to accept. I am all about take that in my games. And like I, it's kind of like when I play games, I'm kind of like role playing a person who is not me, who likes beating other people very much. Um, whereas in real life, I like to share everything and, and make everybody happy. Um, but I'm, I'm very aggressive when I play games, even with my children and even with other people's children and my students. Um, but the, I find that if you're going to use uh, take that in a game, it has to be uh, something that is subtle not in your face if you're making games for kids or or for families yes i mean that makes a lot of sense because sometimes kids could you know get a little too much enjoyment out of it and then it's no fun for the other kid <laughs> that's right um so uh i think at one point you said that you typically design the games for adults and then make them good for kids yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit about that process? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I like to, uh, my family's coming in. Hi. 
Um, I like to enjoy the games that I play. Um, mm. And I like to enjoy when I play with my children. So for me, I need to find enjoyment in a game and then I can tailor it so that my kids can enjoy it. And if I'm enjoying it and I can tailor it for my kids to enjoy, then it's a really amazing experience for all of us. So sometimes that means uh, taking things out of something I've designed or adding something in to make it easier or make it more uh, fun and surprising. Um, but just, I, my my favorite kind of game is a Euro and my kids don't enjoy Euros whatsoever. So I don't typically um, sit down to design a Euro unless it's got something extra special in it that I think will jump out at, at kids or kids. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of Rec Raiders because that's kind of Euro-ish. Um, yes. That's one of my favorite of your games. Um, so Thank for you. those of you who haven't played Rec Raiders, uh, it's part decks. Um, I don't know. I like the dice rolling part of it where you're rolling the dice in the lid of the uh, box. And depending on where the dice go, you get different resources. But the Euro-ish part of it is that there's these different sections and you send your uh, submarine guys there. And if they're connected to other people, um, I think like, like you can kind of help out everyone like but like do you want to help out other people exactly. or do you want to help out you even more yeah like sometimes it's about timing and if you need something and you know the other person's not winning you don't mind helping them but you don't always want to do that so there are a lot of good decisions to be making um which is really nice because you see kids who are eight years old really thinking about things and in, in a way that they might not have thought about things before like do i really want to help this person who is is winning the game do i want to help them more or do i want to help myself mm -hmm. yeah. yeah uh that's i bet that that's super interesting seeing a kid like go through that thought process for the first time um i've only play tested with kids like um, only a few times when I can like either like get them at cons um, to have their parents come over or like when mm -hmm. I can borrow like kids of my friends um, for play testing purposes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, really, it's really amazing watching that light go on. And the thing that brought us to the kinds of games we make actually really came from that first design of ours, which is Food Fighters, because you can play that game just by throwing dice, basically, or, uh, you know, rolling dice, not really knowing what you're doing. And as the game progresses, you start having to think about where you want to place your uh, fighters um, and how you're going to proceed with your attacking the other team. And watching kids starting to understand that as they're playing is the most like it brings such joy to me because they're, this is like the first time they've ever used tactics or strategy in a game ever, you know? Like they're not playing Hungry Hippos or, or uh, Shoots and Ladders where, you know, it really doesn't matter what you do, the game just progresses. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a really good point um, about there's so many like kids games out there where the game just plays itself essentially yeah. like it'll eventually end even if the kid is like not engaged at all um, but like letting a child like for the first time know that like their destiny is in their own hands at least for this next like half hour or something yeah it's really it's really such an amazing thing mm -hmm. Do you have any advice about playtesting with kids and families, especially when they're not maybe your own? Um, yeah, uh, I think the thing to do is to learn how to speak to kids. I think that that's really the most important thing. You can't talk to them in the same way that you that you talk to adults. You can't explain things in the same way. Um, it's also very helpful to have somebody who they're close to around them also learning at the same time. Um, and the reason that's helpful is because 
they know what the capacity of their children is. And if you have said something that maybe they don't understand, the parent is going to immediately intervene and say, "That's this is what that means in the kid's own language. Um, so having an adult there that the kid is used to being around is, I, I think, a, a really good tip. Um, it's also really important to, like, not just watch what's going on, but listen to what they're saying. Um, that should give you a lot of information about how the game is going and if they're enjoying it. Not all the time is a child going to be jumping for joy because they did well in the game or you know had a really good move because perhaps they don't really know you that well and so they're not so comfortable around you. Um, but often they'll say things that will make you uh, know that they're enjoying themselves. Um, because the first thing I always ask kids is, did you have fun? And then the second thing I ask them is, why did you have fun? And uh, sometimes they don't know why they had fun. So you have to prompt them with, what kinds of things did you like in this game? Did you like the, the way this moves? Did you like how you drew the cards? Did you like where you placed your worker? Um, so you don't always get all of the information you need from them. So you need to continue to ask them questions. And again, having an adult that they're comfortable with around them is very helpful. Mm -hmm. That's some really good points about like keeping to ask questions. Um, what I've been, I've actually like really liked play testing with kids because they might actually seem to know like their brain a little better or like, Maybe they're more honest um, than other playtesters because, like, adult playtesters, um, like, even if they don't know the answer, they think that they might know the answer. But when a kid doesn't know, they'll just tell you. Right. That is very true. That is very true. One of the other things I think we need to be aware of sometimes is the, um, the arms – at arm's reach, the children that we have at arm's reach for us are typically gamers kids. And so typically they are versed in how to talk about games and what they like about games and which games you know are exciting for them. If you're looking at creating a game that is a little more toward the mainstream, you don't wanna be playing with kids of adult gamers because they're not gonna give you the same uh, feedback that you would get from a more mass game. Um, so I think you really need to think about who your audience is gonna be. Like we make games for gamers and gamer kids. We know that our games are not, I mean, hopefully one day they will go to mass market, but we, we know that they're not going to, and, and that's fine for us. That's not what we set out to do. We like the games that we make, and we want to continue making them the way we want to make them. Um, but you really have to think about who is playing the game um, and where you, like what direction you want the game to be going in. Mm -hmm. That's a super great point. Like. Uh, because you can look at kids like uh, the cardboard kid who like is an amazing kid um, yep. and she plays all these super hard euros that like, you know, might be really hard for some adults. But like yep. because her whole family plays games like, you know, she can just do whatever. She has all these opinions on games. Um, but like a typical kid her age, like not in a board gaming family, like might not be able to play even like like Catan or some other game. Right. Like super gateway game. Yeah. Do you have any like um, thoughts on, I don't know, like gamer ages or like trying to interpret like, like if you put your uh, game in front of a kid that might not be from a gamer family, like if it's a fit for that age? Um, that, that's a hard one. You know, like I said, we say eight plus on our games typically because of the small components that are in them, um, because there are certain stages that, that the, the laws in different countries change at. And so eight plus is far enough away from three that we don't have to worry about choking. Um, 
But we also say eight because we know that a gamer's kid will be able to play our games at six years old and sometimes even five years old. Um, but mostly uh, kids in, in the general population um, will have a better time with it when they're eight. It's, it's hard to tell, I think, when you don't have as much experience with kids um, or you haven't play tested your games with kids because I'm a teacher and I mean, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but I bring all of my prototypes into my classroom and my students play them. And I've taught kids that are 13 years old and 14 years old. And I've taught kids that are eight and nine years old. And I can tell who's who's able to deal with it and at what stage. So mostly the games that we make um, are sort of middle of the road, 10 years old for eight to 10 years old for, for kids who don't really have that much experience playing games. Um, but I really do suggest if you're gonna make family games or games that adults like and, and kids can play, that you really do um, a wide breadth of, of uh, play testing with them and figure out who it seems to be the most comfortable playing at what age category. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a couple of designers in here that want to enter the HABA contest. Um, and, uh, well, with coronavirus and the state of things as they are, um, do you have any advice uh, or, like, things to look for when they're trying to design this game for um, kids, but they don't have any that they can play test with right now? Yeah, that is, that's a really hard one because it's not like you can put it on a tabletop simulator and have, have kids playing with it. Um, I mean, I don't know that I, I think maybe the best advice for this time, this difficult time that we're all having, um, is probably to make a game with as few rules as possible. Um, when you do that, kids retain more and uh, they're able to access it a little bit better. The other thing you could do is possibly try to find um, a family that would be willing to have a Zoom session with you and get them to print out whatever game it is uh, that you're making, teach it to them over Zoom and have them play it with a camera um, showing the, the board or whatever it is that you've designed um, and then and then doing it that way uh, I know I know some designers who are that's how they're working now because you know it's impossible to get uh, get a hold of people outside um, so that I think is probably the best advice just get them to print it out or send it to them um, and have them play it over zoom mm. yeah I think that, that would be really good. Like, then you actually get to see, like, the, the kids playing. And, like, if you're there to explain it, hopefully the session goes pretty well. Right. Um, do you know of any, like, groups or anything where maybe there's designers with kids or? I, you know what? There are a lot of board game family kind of Facebook groups. Um, I have one myself. It's called Tabletop Family Games. Feel free to join it if you'd like. Um, lots of discussion there about the kinds of games that families are playing, not just not just kids, um, but also families that include older people, like grandparents or you know older aunts and uncles. Uh, so it's it's really nice to see that discussion. I think that's a really great place to start understanding what families are playing and what kids like to play outside of the mainstream. It's easy to find out what kids are playing in the mainstream because all you have to do is turn on the cartoons in the morning and you know all the all the ads for the stupid games pop up. <laughs> Oops, did I just say that? <laughs> uh, but yeah, like sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd say that uh, uh, the tabletop family games group is really good. It's it's really nice to see like 
like as Helena said, like what people are actually playing and what people like keep playing um, to know like what kind of mechanics actually stick with a family versus all these games that like seem shiny and cool, but like then they're gone. I I find that a game that is immersed in theme that also has me- mechanics that are uh, that make sense with the theme that are very immersive. Um, I find those are the games that stick the most. Uh, You know, just looking at uh, what kids are playing in those groups or families are playing in those groups. Yeah, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I imagine, like, the kids really like to get into it. Like, like if it's a game about, like, I don't know, fish or something, they can pretend that they're fish or they can get into it, like, in the whole role-playing sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to let us know or uh, come in. Um, I got one. Okay, Aaron. So we've got some family friends that um, have kids like 7 and 13 maybe, I think. Anyway, um, they profess to love board games as a family and we've been there a couple of times and discovered that when they say they love board games, they love Catan. And Catan is the only game they ever want to play and the only game their kids ever want to borrow from us. And so <laughs> any advice on how to break a family or some kids that really love Catan or entryway games into sort of the broader landscape of games that are out there? You know, it's really hard. And I find this with my own kids also. It's really hard to get kids out of routine. And what I mean by that is they understand and they know how to play the game. And so the, and, and it's a daunting teach at first, if, if you're not a gamer, te- learning how to play Catan is not an easy thing to do because the last game you played was Sorry. And there are a lot of things to know. So you've already established that you like this game and that you know the rules and it's so easy to sit down and do it. So what you wanna do is you wanna find another game that has similar mechanisms where you can say, you know, just like the thing you do in Catan, where you place the worker on this, you know, and I'm going to, you know, go out there and advertise my own game and say Rec Raiders is a really awesome connection to Catan because of the worker placement. And you're also rolling dice. And so now you've got a new theme and you have sort of new mechanisms, but you're doing kind of the same thing. So they'll they'll kind of understand it from the beginning, which is nice. Is that helpful? Awesome. Okay. So um, what are you, some things that you've had to do to change a game to fit more as a kid's game? Uh, take things out, take a lot out. Um, so the way it works is I don't I don't design games by myself. For me, it games together are a very social thing, even designing them. Um, so when I sit down to design a game, it's typically with my husband because he's here. And you know, when it's 12:30 at night and we're going to bed and you know, I'm half asleep and I just say, oh my God, I just had this amazing idea. I'll have the idea, he'll come up with some mechanisms, we'll try it, the game will get like 10 times bigger than it needs to be, and then you just have to take everything out. Um, So like I said, we design it so that we like it. I design a game so that I enjoy playing it myself. And then I think about what are the things my students and my children are not going to be able to get their heads around. We take that out and we try to work that to become like this this medium. So like, you know, we start up here and the kids are down here and we uh, we bring it down a little bit for ourselves, but we push kids a little bit more to learn something that uh, perhaps they haven't known before playing games. So it's harder for kids to play our games than it is for adults to play our games, but that's because they have a greater learning curve than, than I guess, than gamers do. Mm-hmm. Um, so you say you take out stuff for kids. Like, have you ever added anything to make it appeal to kids more? 
Um, never added. Well, I mean, I, I think that when we design games uh, or publish other people's games, the, the question is always, are we going to like this? And if we like this, are the kids going to like it? Most of the time, I find that they enjoy the things that we enjoy. So we don't specifically put in anything to make it more fun. However, we have tried that before. And, and sometimes, like, I guess the times that we have tried it, that's failed. Uh, I'll give you an example. So for Haunt the House, um, Originally, it was a deck building game, but we wanted the game to be really thematic. So when you played a card, you had to, it, they're called scares. You had to make the sound of the scare. And it was fun when we thought about it. And, you know, the two of us played it together and then we played it with the kids and the kids are like, no, <laughs> no, no, we're not, I don't want to do this, <laughs> no. And it, it that part wasn't fun for them. So like, even though I think I know what kids want all the time, I don't always know what they want. Um, so I find that anytime we've actually tried to put something in specifically to make it more exciting for kids, that just doesn't, it just doesn't work. <laughs> um, that's so funny though. Like, uh. I'm not, I'm, I'm actually like, the first time we played that game with the kids, I was like, you guys are gonna love this game. It is amazing. Wait till you see the things you have to do in it. And they were just like, this, this is no, nope. And I couldn't understand why they wouldn't want to be making these sounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right, it sounds like uh, kids can be kind of like cats, where like whenever you buy anything for a cat, it just hates it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So, anyone else have any questions so far? I have a anecdote to share. Not so much a question, but just something that's interesting related to kids and boards games. Sure. Sure. Um, so we have some other friends. They have a kid or two now, but um. When their son was about four years old, my wife and I went to visit and we took over some dexterity game that I picked up in a bargain bin. Um, it's about throwing cannonball tokens to try and get the enemy pirate ship. And uh, we took it over and their kid was really excited but wasn't yet able to play the game. Like his dad had to sit there with him and help him throw the cannonballs. And he had a lot of fun, but it was sort of just a little bit beyond his abilities as a four year old. And didn't really think much more of it. It was an interesting experiment. Um, but recently we had them over again and their kid recently turned five, which is interestingly the recommended age for this particular game. Um, and as soon as he walked into our lounge room, he ran over to the game shelf and pointed to this game and said, oh, I want to play this game. And we asked him why, and he actually didn't ever remember playing it previously, but for some yeah. reason he knew that he wanted to play that game in particular. And so he pulled it out, and sure enough, he was actually able to play it all by himself this time and really loved it. And so, although he didn't consciously recall having played it before with me and stroking to play it, something in the memory had stuck, and he was like, oh, yeah, I want to play that one. And it was, like, really great, and he enjoyed it and had a blast. So it was just an interesting little experience. And, and that's why I say you really have to pay attention to what kids are saying uh, and how they're experiencing it, because... Sometimes you think that maybe they didn't have a good experience, but they did. But they did. Yeah. And, and so, you know, something something obviously stuck out for him. Um, or maybe yeah. that's just the one that he somehow recognized. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. That's, that's cool. Interesting. That's cool. So uh, what's the next thing going on for Helena? Oh. <sighs> The beginning of the year was really light. Um, we just as we ramped up our play testing for our next game, the pandemic hit and had to put everything on hold. So we had to figure out how we were going to deal with this. And uh, Tabletop Simulator came in. And uh, we put everything on Tabletop Simulator. And we got a game ready for the, um, the Burnt Island Games uh company it is 
really, I mean, it, it's even really hard to describe how amazing this game is. It is full of new mechanisms that I've, I've never seen in another game. Um, but essentially you're, pay, you're playing secret agents in the future in a city called New Dawn City and you're trying to take down the syndicate and you're doing that by hooking into uh, their brains and acting as them um, and getting close to uh, close to the other members of the syndicate and doing things so they begin to trust you and getting their intel so that you can uh, you can bust them basically is is what you're trying to do. Um, it's incredibly innovative. I'm very excited about it. It is going to Kickstarter in two and a half weeks, uh, which is which is really exciting. Um, we're already three months late, so uh, I'm glad we got it to this point. It's been like a lot of people have played it already, and we are getting rave reviews. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so that's for Burnt Island Games. And then we just a couple of weeks ago announced our next uh, KTBG or Kids Table Board Gaming game. It's called Creature Comforts uh, and it's uh, designed by Roberta Taylor and um, the art is by Shauna Tenney. Um, and it's primarily a uh, all female game. And I'm really excited about that because this has been one of my dreams as well to make a game with uh, the major players being uh, women. And uh, it's happening, I'm so excited. Yeah, that is definitely um, uh, an achievement. Like I've been, that's also one of my dreams and I'm gonna have, uh, that game will come out sometime next year. Um, but yeah, like coordinating it so that you get like like the designer, graphic designer, illustrator, and all that, all to be women, like that's hard. It's hard. It's really hard. Um, you know, uh, like Josh is involved. He's doing the creative director uh, director position, but uh, you know, I'm not going to throw him out of the company because I want an all an all women game. Um, and also, I think he's amazing. Um, at, at what he does, but I, I'm really, I'm really excited to have this. I've been waiting for like the longest time and, and I played Roberta's game like three years ago for the first time and it had a different theme. And I said uh, that I actually loved the theme, but for us, it, it wouldn't have been the right direction to go. I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but it just, it wasn't uh, the right way for us to go. And uh, she rethemed it and gave it back to us. And it was even better than it was before, which is amazing. So I've been waiting for the longest time for and the announcement and uh, finally here. Yeah. yeah, well, congrats. Like, it's Thank you. Exciting. Um, did you learn anything about um, playtesting in uh, tabletop simulators since you had to do that pivot? Yes, the thing I learned and if you're going to do some play testing and you haven't done it before, is imagine your game is 30 minutes in real life. It's going to take an hour in on Tabletop Simulator. That's the thing I learned. Uh, and, I, and I also learned that if you can get someone to script your game, it's gonna make things move a lot smoother. Um, I find Tabletop Simulator, although it's been you know, we're so lucky that we have it, otherwise we wouldn't be making these games. Um, I find it very sticky. I don't enjoy the experience overall. I love the fact that I'm playing a board game and I get to play with my friends, but I don't I don't love the experience in the same way that I love playing board games in real life, but I don't have a choice right now, so. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like. Uh, like in real life, I know how to move my hands and they do the things that I want them to do. Like mm -hmm. I can pick up cards and I don't just drop them into the abyss. <laughs> That's right. Fall um, off the side of the table. Oh, where did it go? Who knows? It'll appear at some point in time, maybe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, uh, they both, uh, some of the regulars here know, like, uh, that I get, I get so angry at Tabletop Simulator. Like, it's just, like, if, if there's any, like, weirdness 
with the game like uh like i was playing a game where you had to like put cards into your hand but then flip them over and like do like put them in order or something and it was just like i can't do this i can't pick up cards ordering stuff if it's not scripted to do the thing you want it to do is that's the thing that adds the most time i find like we have uh each individual player in the game into deep has a stack of um like circle wooden circle bits and you have to change the order of the stack on your turn and Sometimes it takes me like a minute to actually get through the stack to, so I get it into the right, it's such a pain in the butt. Anyway, thank goodness it's there because again, we wouldn't be where we are without it. So I, I can't really can't complain that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and it's better than Tabletopia. Well, in my opinion, it's- Why do you think that? Um, I played a game in Tabletopia this week and like even, putting like one card on top of another was weird. Um, I don't know in tabletop simulator, like I've gotten used to like the selection so I can like select a lot of things and like put them where I want to go. Right. Um, it could just be that I've used tabletop simulator a lot more. So I like, I know the tricks and stuff like that. And I go into, like the, sorry, yeah. go on. Oh, uh, and go into tabletopia where I don't know. And I'm not familiar. Like it's just different. And right. I like the look of Tabletop Tabletopia better. I feel like the interface is a little bit nicer, but I just, I mean, it's all the same. It's all the same. And yes, when you're used to knowing which letters to press to, to change the view and all of that stuff, it, it really, that makes a difference. Um, so Aaron was wondering, um, will your brands be accepting submissions going forward given you're going back to teaching? Yes, absolutely. Um, so right now uh, I am working full time and next year, school year, I'm going to be working full time at two jobs. So yes, we, we definitely are continuing. Um, we have someone working with us right now, Sean, who is amazing and I don't, we'd be nowhere without him. Um, and he's part time now, he'll be going full time next year. So he'll do, I'll do more of the big picture stuff. Um, and he'll do a little bit more of the, you know, nitty gritty day to day thing. Oh, Good to well, know. Thanks. Uh, that's super exciting. So, like, how did you find somebody that you were willing to trust to take <laughs> over things? Uh, you know, Sean, actually, we live in Toronto, mm -hmm. and Sean happens to live around the corner from us. Oh. It's amazing. Uh, not that we have seen him in the last three months, but uh, he lives around the corner from us. We've known him from, you know, Toronto, all the Toronto gamers know each other. Um, and he used to work at Snakes and Lattes many years ago. I don't know if you've heard of Snakes and Lattes. It's our big cafe here. It sort of started the whole cafe thing, um, gamer cafe thing. Um, so he worked there for a while um, and then moved on to Simon. And while he was working at Simon, he was doing some writing and did some previews for us for some of our games. and. Uh, you know, we just kept in touch with him through the years. And like just over a year ago, he decided he was going to leave Simon. And I was like, well, this is really good timing because we kind of need somebody to work with us. And uh, he was totally stoked about it. And, and again, like, uh, I don't know what we would do without him. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to be uh, when he's in charge a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is definitely exciting, and congrats for you because, like, uh, well, I I'm kind of in the same position where like I want to get more people to help, but like I I'm too much of a control freak at the moment to to let that go. And yeah, and that's that's one thing in my life altogether, even beyond this job, is that it's very hard for me to give up uh, doing the thing the way I want it to be done. Um, but we've worked together for long enough now that I, I trust that he understands what I am expecting um, and that he brings a little bit of his own flair into it because I think that uh, more diversity means more diversity, you know, like we, we don't 
always have to go in the same direction. It's nice to have other people's opinions and thoughts and ideas integrated into what we're doing. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, if you can find somebody where, like, together you make something so much better than you could have alone, that's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Helena did bring up Toronto, um, in the Toronto area. And if any of you, like, uh, are into traveling. Um, I did go to Prototio, um, which is a fantastic uh, prototyping conference um, or uh, convention. Um, and I got to meet Helena and like a bunch of the other Toronto um, like uh, designers. And there's a big design scene there and everyone's super nice, um, probably because they're all Canadian and like all <laughs> Canadians are amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not so true, but the community here is, it's amazing. And everyone's so supportive of everyone else. And it's big, but it's small. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people who, who live in small towns, they say, you're so lucky because I'm the only gamer in my town, or I have to drive for 45 minutes to get to someone else who can play the kind of games I want to play. And we're very, very lucky here. If I want a game night, all I do is put an all call on, on Facebook and I've got 20 people who are, you know, want to come over and play games with us. So it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, I think we covered a lot of stuff. I think the, uh, the Kickstarter is our next big thing and, and we're really excited for it. And, uh, There'll be a link out soon to uh, to click on Remind Me when the uh, when it uh, launches. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here, and thank you all for watching and participating. Um, it's been a great hour. So I hope you it all was. have a great day. Thank you so much, Carla, and thanks everyone else for being here. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Oh, and Charlie said, awesome chat. He learned a lot. Oh, good. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, anyone can contact me through either of my companies. If you have any further questions, I'm happy to answer them anytime. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that's, that's, okay. that's okay. I, uh, I, could have, I could have said that when you said, do you have anything else? I should have said that. Uh, but there you go. Yeah. It's it's hard times right now. Like even like we we talked coherently for an hour, so we did great. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, but yeah, um, I'll put the links and stuff in uh, the Discord, and once you have the Kickstarter like links, I'll put that in there too. So cool. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Thank you guys. Thank you, Carla. Yeah. Have a great night. All right. Good night, everyone.